Welcome to the Nutrition Mission Podcast. This is where we're going to share information about nutrition and have insights into your own personal needs as well as product information as well as other information. You've got to be part of this nutrition mission. This is the official Clark's Nutrition and Natural Foods Market Podcast. And we've been helping people live better lives since 1972. We're on a nutrition mission. Join us. Hi, this is Starkey Sowers. Welcome to Nutrition Mission. This is the first episode in the Clark's Nutrition, Nutrition Mission podcast. And we're going to be covering like almost every topic you could imagine in this particular like series that we're going to do. Kind of excited to uh, kind of get it rolling. But before we do it, I thought it's important for us to kind of lay the foundation on what Clark's Nutrition is, where it came from a little bit, and also maybe talk about like health food stores in general and also talk about superfoods. I don't think there's any way that you can talk about a health food store without talking about superfoods. So we're going to talk about superfoods as well. All right, so here's a couple of thoughts. Number one, Clark's Nutrition has literally been in business for many years. In fact, let's just kind of t- type it back a little bit and kind of look at some of the, uh, the situations. First of all, what we'll do is we'll take the Riverside store. It's the one that's actually been Clark's Nutrition the longest. And we'll do a little history on it. 1929 comes around and I started doing a bunch of research and literally went to the downtown uh, library and found like some 1929 phone books. That's the first phone books you can actually find. So I thought, you know what, let's look through and see if I can find anything to do with like a health food store. And I found what was called Riverside Health Emporium. And so ultimately it was on Main Street, ultimately ended up being about a block away from where Clark's bought the store in uh, 1972. But a little history before that, the Opplingers bought it and then later on the Rishes bought it. So right around like late 1960s, early 1970s, we end up with a store that was called Rishes Health Food Store. And then the Clarks buy it in 1990, uh, 1972. Jim and Amy Clark are the first ones to buy the health food store. And so ultimately when you look at it, Jim was a, he was a manager at one of the Smart and Finals in Riverside and Amy kind of worked alongside him for years and and did all sorts of different things and so they bought it and just kind of was like a venture for them to like start their own business and so they, of course they knew the riches and they bought it from them and jump in and took the store over all right so we end up in a situation they take it over so I'm like 12 years old I literally had been going into the store for like two years my dad's gym was like a block away had to go over there to buy lunch and do different types of stuff and so I go rolling in and I kind of get to meet Jim Clark right and it's like I'm 12 years old so you know it's Jim Clark. Yeah, cool. And so bottom line is after a period of time, as I grow older, start getting into my competitive bodybuilding years as a teenager, get to know the store more and more. And ultimately my dad ends up selling the gym. I work for GNC. And then I come to work for these guys like in 1981. So in that moment, a little bit in between 1978, Ray Clark and Carol Clark bought what was called the Max Nutrition Center. And that Max Nutrition Center is over in San Bernardino, literally on Baseline and E on the corner of Baseline on and E Street. And so and literally just above Baseline. And so they buy that in 1978. And so it was kind of a funny story. If you hear the story on it, it was kind of like, hey, should we buy a liquor store or should we buy a health food store? And I think that the thing that actually swayed Ray uh, into the decision, number one, was his wife, Carol. She was like an ex-Mormon. And she's like, no way are we going to buy a liquor store? And he's like, hey, business is business. And so somewhere along the line, he ended up having like a prostate infection and prostate problems. Ended up going into Max. And he knew the Max because, once again, he worked at a Smart and Final, ran Smart and Finals, and they went in and bought different things. And so ultimately they said, yeah, come on in. We've got some stuff. Eat some pumpkin seeds, take some bee pollen, do some stuff like that. That'll help your prostate. So it kind of like in a matter of weeks after going to the doctor multiple times, he started feeling better. And he was like, oh my gosh, what is this? You know, I want to get into this thing. And so he starts getting into it. And then lo and behold, in 1978, he buys what we call Clark's Nutrition Act. At the time it was called Max Nutrition. 
So a couple little things transpire. He immediately changes the name to Clark's. Time kind of ticks on, and then Ray decides, um, you know what? Grandpa Jim wants to retire. His dad wants to retire from Riverside. So he kind of takes over both of the stores, probably about 1982, 1983. So there's like an explosion going on, and I'll get into that, the details on that. But ultimately what happened from that point on, 1998, we end up in a situation where we take over an old Stater Brothers in Loma Linda, and that becomes the Loma Linda store. And then 2000. 2005, we open up a store down in Rancho Mirage, and that was literally from ground up building and then uh, building that was actually done with Bruce Clark and a bunch of the family members. And then lo and behold, 2014, we literally go over, take over an old Ralph's over in Chino, and we have store number four. So one thing I want to do, though, is kind of lay a little bit of foundation. You know, obviously, Ray Clark and, and Amy Clark and Jim Clark and Carol Clark, you know, founders really of this of the two original stores. And uh, a couple of things that were unique. Number one, uh, there's a lot of, you know, employees that, you know, like saturated this, this landscape, so to speak. And it's too, you know, too numerous to name them all. But ultimately, when I first started, there was six employees. Now we've got about 200. And so when you look at it, there's a lot of different of us that just kind of came alongside, worked with the family and got excited about doing the deal and just loved being part of the whole nutrition business. And what was unique about it, it was very, very grassroots. And so what I'm going to do is like kind of give you a little bit of history about the industry itself. So you just kind of like maybe feel, you know, like you're a little bit filled in on how the industry worked, right? So I think it's quick. I brought some stuff here. I've got all these different types of foods. I've got some different companies up here to represent. And we'll talk about it. If you can't see it, I'll describe it to you. I feel like you should be able to understand it when I'm done. And so ultimately, um, let's kind of get a feel for where this whole business came from. So let's, let's paint a picture. Let's go like 1850, okay? So 50% of the labor force is farming, and they're out there doing their thing and everything like that. And so to put food on the table was very difficult. Nowadays, I think it's like less than half percent of the labor force is in farming, and we produce a lot more foods. And ultimately, the way that we do that, obviously, is through mechanical farming and things of that nature, and those practices are much less laborious. All right. So imagine this refinement of foods really starts happening about 1850s, 1860s. So let's talk about re what a refinement of foods is. That's the white flour. That's the white, the, the white rice. It's also going to be in a situation where you're like partitioning foods or breaking it down into pieces and maybe eating some units of it. So egg whites versus whole eggs and things of that nature. And so it's kind of a refinement or a partition of foods. And it really kind of starts happening very aggressively for a couple things. First of all, remember, no refrigerations were in place. So because there's no refrigerations in place, preserving things was critical. They used salt, they used pickling, fermentation, different things like that. What they found was this, though. And when it came to grains specifically, if you refined the grains and had white flour, white bread, ultimately it didn't spoil on the shelf as quick. And so... We're sitting there and we're like, okay, this is a great adage. And so literally by the 1880s, 1890s, the theme almost be, ends up being like this. The better the food is, the more refined it is. And the concept was like the reason why is it doesn't spoil on the shelf. It lasts. It's almost being preserved, things of that nature. And so what happened was the lack of nutrients was huge. And people didn't understand what nutrients were. They understood. So you have to understand, the first vitamin doesn't even get discovered until 1910. So we start refining foods, and there's all these diseases that are creeping up, beriberi, pellagra, and different things that end up later just being nutrient deficiency diseases. And ultimately what happens is this. We end up in a situation where we're like going, oh my gosh, where are these things? They're like contagious. It's like COVID or it's like the flu. You know, you went next door, and then you end up getting this stuff, right? And so bottom line is, no, they were actually nutrient deficiency diseases, right? And so in the 1870s, there was a lot of different people that I call the educators that were starting to stand up. And one of them was Sylvester Graham. Another one was Ellen White, which is one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And they were standing up and saying, hey, look, all these refined foods are not good for you. If you go off these refined foods, ultimately you'll get rid of these diseases that we're having. And so it was literally kind of this toss of war. And eventually what happens is by the early 1900s, we start discovering that we've got actually some specific nutrients that are in these refined foods that 
have been lost that are creating and causing nutrient deficiency diseases. All right, so these superfoods are being birthed at the same time. It was like, okay, we got to eat these superfoods because these superfoods are going to cure us of all these diseases. And some of these educators, like I said, Ellen White, were sitting there saying, hey, let's do a couple of things. So I, I brought some Weedabix with me, and this is like one of the original cereal situations. And so you look at this, and this is just... Basically, it's just whole whole wheat and it's barley malt, a little bit of sugar and stuff. It's just like whole wheat. Dude, it's like fiber. I mean, you eat this stuff, it's like, you know, ultimately like crazy stuff. It's like shredded wheat on steroids, right? So ultimately what they were saying is, no, no, you need to get back to whole foods and eat these whole foods. And what would happen is they would say these superfoods will like cure you of these diseases. Well, ultimately it wasn't the diseases, it was the lack of nutrients that was causing these diseases. And ultimately these superfoods had nutrients in that that prevented you from having it. So where did you get these superfoods? Well, you went to a health food store. And so that was the place you had to go. You had to go to this health food store to be able to get these good foods because of the wonder breads and all the processed breads have hit the shelves and everyone thinking this is the cool way to go. So you've got to go off the grid in order to be able to get healthy. And so that's where these uh, health food stores kind of originated. So the first one we actually see is Martindale's in 1869 in Chicago. Uh, later on, a bunch of different franchises will pop up. We'll talk a little bit about that. But ultimately what happened is the idea was to get local foods that was sustainable, that was basically kind of grown in a clean environment that put us in a situation where we actually were getting real foods and ultimately people started getting better. Remember, like I said, one of the things that happens in this situation was this. We didn't know what vitamin B1 was. We didn't know what B2 was. We didn't know what vitamin A was. We didn't know what vitamin D was. We had these nutrient deficiency diseases and we were clueless to what was going on. And these superfoods, as everyone was describing them, made the huge difference. So ultimately, you know, that was kind of the birth of the health food stores. And that kind of give you a little Clark's information, a little bit of Clark's history so you understand that and kind of get a grip on what that's all about and a lot of these guys what they did is they actually did what we call health lectures classic one was was uh, Paul Bragg and later on his daughter Patricia Bragg and they literally toured the world I mean they went all over and Billy Graham even said like if you did a Paul Bragg routine it would be one of the best things that you can do so you had the synergy that was happening at the time and the other thing that happened is the book Back to Eden this thing's literally like 700 pages long it's literally it was written in dictation where his daughter literally just took his dictation he's the guy that told you how to make soy milk for people that couldn't handle milk all Right? So the other thing he also talked about was using herbs and how to use herbs. And basically, and this, so this comes around like 1910, 1920. And he's literally telling you, in order to stay healthy, to stay away from colds, flu, sickness, you've got to eat right. You've got to eat whole foods, stay away from these partitioned foods. And so I like to like mention those like as maybe two primary ones. One of the things to go back and kind of talk about the Braggs, as I said, he literally toured the world. One of the things he did, and I kind of brought with me today, it's kind of some fun stuff. I brought some white flour uh, tortilla, right? So kind of as a little ex example, and if you see the video, you can see it. So one of the things that he would do is he would take white flour and he would mash it up and basically make it like into this dough paste, right? And he would just say, look, man, this stuff's not good for you. It's like bad for your intestinal system. You can take it and you can bounce it like a ball and do whatever you want with this stuff. It's kind of crazy, right? So then what he would do is he would take some whole grain bread, and I brought with me the sprouted seven grain bread from the Food for Life guys over there in Corona. And ultimately what they do with their grains, they take them and they soak them and they sprout them and ultimately produce what is probably the most digestible bread that you can get your hands on. Then at the same time, what it does is it has enough of the grains added together to give you a complete protein. So what he would do is he would take stuff like this and then he would like mash it up and then you would see that it just doesn't form into like a ball. And so I'm mashing it up in front of the video here so in case you want to have a look at it. And what it doesn't do is it doesn't collectively get together like a ball. And so that was like one of his things that he did. He was kind of roll around, talk about that. He talked about the benefits of apple cider vinegar. And a lot of things what was going on back in those days was foods were, like I said, getting partitioned. So one of the things he did is he came out with a soy sauce that was liquid aminos. And so it was like more of a fermented amino acid product as opposed to actually chemically making it because they were just chemically making it during World War II. Another thing that he talked about too was fasting. He talked about eating whole foods, fasting, as well as working out on a regular basis. And one of the things he did is actually, he actually in Griffith Park as well as in Honolulu and other different places, he had exercise classes outside and he sponsored and talked about about all these whole foods and he had hundreds of people that would come around and talk to him about it. So one of the things that he would do is he'd like go, okay, I got all these people listening to me, all these people, you know, hearing what the message that I've got. I've got brewer's yeast. I've got all these different types of foods that I think would be beneficial for people and my books. He had a bunch of books. And so what he said is like, 
where can I put this stuff? And so he would literally go knocking on people's doors and say, look, uh, you've got a store. I want to put a health food section in your store. A lot of people, oh, dude, you're a nut. There's no way I'm going to do this. And so what he would do is like, okay, if those that said yes, he would literally go in, frame in the walls and put in like cupboards and shelves and everything like that, stack in his nutritional stuff. And he goes, I'll call you, you know, back in those days, he finally had a phone. I'll call you and see, or you can write me a letter and I'll send you more stuff. So ultimately what happens is he kind of started what we call the original American health food movement. So somewhere in his, in his tours, he ends up in Pittsburgh and he runs into a guy named David B. Shakari and talks to David B. Shakari and says, Hey man, check it out. Do what you want to do is you want to be in a position where you want to like, you know, do one of these things in my store in your stores. And he had like, kind of like tack and feed stores and stuff like that. He goes, okay, I'll do that. So he puts it in. Of course, Literally in in Pittsburgh, just swarms of people go in and just nail the place down. He ends up in a situation where, next thing you know, all he's doing is making chains of health food stores. And we know that name today as General Nutrition Center. So Paul Bragg and him formed an an allegiance, so to speak, on like starting health food stores. And there was plenty of independent people along the way. That's where Clark's Nutrition comes in. They were one of those first stores that literally just took the goods that was available, took dates from the Coachella Valley, literally any type of things that they get their hands on. So I'm going to do one thing. You know, when you go into a health food store, there's just thousands of things. And so one of the things you want to do is kind of like maybe make it smaller, you know, because when you roll in the door, you think, where in the world did they get all this stuff? There's just no way they got all this stuff, right? It's just insane that they've got all this stuff in here. So if we're going to do this, let's kind of like maybe expand a few things and get a little bit of ideas. So for instance, I love this. I love cod liver oil, and cod liver oil is like awesome for so many things. So when I was a kid, my dad's gym, I was like, a young kid, and, and they say, hey, look, cod liver oil is so amazing for you. It, it's great for arthritis. It's great for immune system. It's great for colds and flu. It's great for this. I used to think, dude, what is wrong with you? Where do you come up with this stuff? You got to remember, this is in the 70s now. So my thinking is like, man, bring some science to this game, because if you're not bringing science to the game, this is not for real. You know, this just doesn't exist. And so, okay, it's good, good for cold and flu. Well, that makes sense because it's got vitamin A in it. Well, vitamin A wasn't discovered until about 1919. So they found vitamin A in cod liver oil, and they took it out and they go, oh, this is the benefits of cod liver oil. Stuff's amazing, right? And so later on they said, you know, that's that's the reason why it's so good for colds and flus and and for bones and things of that nature. Wasn't until 1940 something they actually discover vitamin D. The craze on vitamin D today is insane. We're going to talk about immunity in one of our our next uh, episodes, and so you're going to have to hang in. We'll talk about vitamin D and COVID and things of that nature. So, but ultimately, what happens with vitamin D is we find out it's great for the immune system. It's great for thyroid. It's also great for you know for hormone regulation. It's good for sleep. It's I mean just it's endless, right? And so all these claims that they were talking about was crazy. Well, it doesn't come until 1979 we actually find about omega threes, and so omega threes, of course, are in cod liver oil, which helps with anti-inflammatory process. Helps with mental alertness, helps with immunity, helps with all these other different things. And so what happens when you roll into a health food store, oftentimes, is this. They've taken a substance, they started isolating some of the compounds that are in them and ultimately producing things. And what you're seeing is an explosion of these incredible nutrients that were found in these superfoods. Now, here's my push for you. Don't hesitate to continue to eat superfoods. I think it's critical. At the same time, partition foods have their inc- have some incredible benefits. I personally use vitamin D on a regular basis. I think it's critical. I also think that vitamin D, most people don't get it. Why? Why don't most people get it? Because they don't eat eggs. They don't eat liver. They don't eat the foods that they used to eat back in the 1920s because, hey, they're bad for us, right? And so supposedly, you know, these are foods that we were eating to get these nutrients that we didn't even know we had because they heal these diseases that we considered to be disease, but ultimately ended up being nutrient deficiency diseases. All right, so what should an independent health food store also do? They should be on the cutting edge moving forward. That said, a couple of things I like to talk about. Organic foods wasn't a reality until 2003. We campaigned, we pushed, we made that happen, along with a lot of major corporations. Healthy aging, <coughs> excuse me, healthy aging is something that's going on today that I think is critical. And we've got the cups on that. We're later on the coenzyme Q10 as well as antioxidant level. The other thing is we've got raw milk, raw foods, raw products. We've had those for years. We've got grass-fed beef, grass-fed eggs, and all these other different things as well as things for the immune system, et cetera, et cetera. So here's the thought. 
ultimately one of the things that's going to be critical for a health food store is they're going to be open to the community. They're going to literally be serving the community to keep them healthy. And so that's the Clark's mantra is building health and being in a situation where we help educate our customers to make the best decision they possibly can about their health. And that kind of like sums us up and kind of gives you an idea. It's a good starting grounds to know where we're at and where we're going. All right, this is Starkey Sowers. Thanks for listening to Nutrition Mission. And we've got more in store and more coming for you soon. Thank you guys for joining us today on our Mission Nutrition Podcast, the official Clark's Nutrition and Natural Foods Market Podcast. We've got another exciting episode for you next week. So be sure to review, subscribe, follow us, and stay connected. Absolutely. Be part of it. We've got so much we're going to share with you. It's going to be an amazing ride. We'll see you next time.